Hi guys. Uh, in this video, I, I want to talk with you a little bit about the Euthyphro. I realized reading the excerpt that's included in our ethics text this morning that the author of the text didn't do anything to put that dialogue in context or provide any kind of background information. And so someone coming at that cold, particularly somebody that didn't have any knowledge of Plato or Socrates or how a dialogue works, um, might find that reading really disorienting, and that's not good. Uh, what would be good, though, is if you had enough background or enough context to be able to kind of follow the main points of that argument and then kind of grab from it the major questions that it's raising. So if, if you've already read that dialogue and you feel comfortable with it and you feel like you've grabbed the main points, then you don't need to watch this video. But if you're feeling a little uncertain about it um, or just kind of want to check in with your understanding, then hopefully the, the things that I talk about in this video will be useful to you. So the first thing I'd like to say is just as a general principle, um, anytime you're dealing with a, a complicated text, a difficult text, an old text, um, it's really useful to read it out loud and allow your ears to help your brain work through you know complex syntax or archaic language uh, your ears are going to pick up on things and help make sense of things that your eyes alone won't be able to do and platonic all of plato's dialogues lend themselves to being uh, read aloud because they're dialogues they're they're constructed as conversations uh, usually um, they're conversations between Socrates, who was Plato's teacher, uh, and another person, or sometimes more than one person. And the subject of the discussion is usually a, a concept or an idea, and Socrates uh, finds uh, somebody who claims to know something about uh, an idea, about a concept, a notion, a value, and Socrates approaches that person and says, hey, I, you know, I understand that you claim that you know a lot about virtue or love or piety uh, or justice or courage. Uh, and I'm interested in that too. And, and so I'd like to ask you some questions. And the way that the dialogue unfolds is kind of like what you see in the Euthyphro, um, where Socrates says, well, let me ask you a question. And Socrates' dialogue partner says, oh, okay, well, let me answer that question. And Socrates usually responds to the answer by saying, hmm, now that's really interesting. But here, what about this? I, I see a problem in, in your answer, so let me ask you another question. And it kind of goes back and forth, back and forth this way throughout the dialogue until ultimately um, the person who initially claimed to know something about the, the topic at hand realizes, oh my gosh, I now I realize after this conversation that I didn't know all that I thought I really knew about this subject. And so Socrates says, all right, great. Now let's go and see if we can't together discover some knowledge uh, about that particular topic. Um, you know, in other words, now that, we've, now that we've discovered that the two of us together don't know much of anything about this particular subject, let's see if the two of us together can discover something about it. And the Euthyphro kind of follows that same uh, trajectory. So the f first thing that uh, is important to note about the Euthyphro is its setting. Uh, it's around 399 BCE, before the Common Era, or BC if you prefer. Um, and it takes place on the porch, the steps leading up to uh, King Arkin's court. And it's important to, to know that in this case, uh, the king is not a king of state. It's not a political head. Um, the king in this case is more akin to a, a local magistrate, a judge who's charged with presiding over manslaughter cases, uh, murder cases, cases of impiety, um, uh, and so forth. And so the Euthyphro and Socrates run into each other as they're both walking up the steps. They're both going to the court, but they're going to the court for very different reasons. Euthyphro uh, is going to the court because he wants to um, level m manslaughter charges against his own father. Um, Euthyphro's father owned a slave and that slave he suspected had killed another slave and 
he, the, the Euthyphro's father, couldn't figure out initially what exactly to do in response to this, so he tied the slave up, left him outside while he thought about what to do, gathered the information, and during the night the slave was exposed to the elements and died. And Euthyphro uh, um, believed that, it, that his responsibility as a moral person was to uh, bring charges against his father for manslaughter. Euthyphro is regarded himself as somebody who was knowledgeable about morality, knowledgeable about the good actions, knowledgeable about uh, ethical behavior, and, um, and very confident in his beliefs. So confident, in fact, that he was willing to buck tradition and um, reject his, the, 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 the tug of family loyalty and actually initiate a, a, a lawsuit against his own father, something that was very controversial at the time, something that Euthyphro was ridiculed for because it was such a, a striking break with tradition. Um, Socrates, on the other hand, is going to the king's court not because he's bringing a case against anyone, but because a case has been brought against him, um, and he is going to be brought to uh, the trial that ultimately winds up in his, uh, with his death sentence in a couple of weeks. And so Socrates is going to the court not as a prosecutor, but as a defendant. And when Socrates sees Euthyphro, um, he recognizes an opportunity. And um, the opportunity is this. Euthyphro is a purported expert on, um, in, on piety, morality, the good. And Socrates is being brought to trial. One of the charges that he is being brought to trial to answer to is impiety. Uh, Socrates is being accused of, of immoral behavior. Uh, and so Socrates thinks to himself, well, this is a fortuitous opportunity. I'm going to hit up Euthyphro. Uh, for a conversation about what exactly piety is and what impiety is. And that way, when I'm facing my own prosecutors here in a couple of weeks and they're accusing me of being impious, I can tell them, hey, look, guys, I had a conversation with a, a real authority on these questions of piety and impiety, uh, Euthyphro, and this is what he told me. And so the charges that you're bringing against me, uh, hopefully, don't actually match up with what the authority on piety claims piety is or impiety is. And so that's the sort of context for the conversation. These guys bump into each other and Socrates asks a really simple, straightforward question of Euthyphro. And he says, hey, Euthyphro, you, you, you seem to know something about piety. Well, what is it? What is piety? What is impiety? And for our purposes, um, we should be thinking here about piety in a broader sense than its, its, its usual connotation. It's not necessarily that it's referring to a kind of holiness or godliness. It's, let's think about piety here and the question that Socrates is putting to Euthyphro as a general question about what does it mean, what is the good? And what does it mean to claim that an action is good? Well, what, is, what is right action and what is wrong action? What makes an action good or right? Um, and and w w what is this? Uh, and so Euthyphro, uh, confident chap that he is, takes up Socrates' question and he says, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the lowdown on, on piety or goodness. Um, piety is doing what I'm doing. Uh, piety is, uh, if you want to know what piety is, just look at me and watch what I, look at what I'm doing here. And this is piety. Uh, that is to say, I think what Euthyphro actually says is something along the lines of, you know, if you prosecute somebody that you believe is guilty of murder or sacrilege or some other similar kind of crime, then you're a pious person. And if you don't do these things, uh, if you don't prosecute somebody that you know has committed murder, then you're an impious person, which is sort of a kind of response that we would expect a, a fairly confident is the kind term, arrogant might be the less kind term, uh, unthinking would be a fair term. Uh, it, it, it might be the kind of response we would expect from a person we would describe that way. Uh, because what, essentially what you think we're saying is, you know, hey, you want to you wanna be really smart? Well, think my thoughts. Uh, you want to be really good? Do what I do. And Socrates is not buying into that for, for one minute, and, and he says in response to Euthyphro, gee, thanks for that answer, um, but I didn't ask you for examples or illustrations of specific manifestations of piety. I, I need you to think uh, in more general terms, Euthyphro. 
Um, I need you to think about uh, piety as an idea, as a concept. I want you to think about the general idea, not just specific instances of piety being manifest, um, but I want you to think about the idea of piety. And I want you to describe for me what exactly piety is, not just in specific instances, but in all instances. And Euthyphro makes a revision to his claim at that point, and it's a significant revision um, because he takes it away. He takes his definition of piety away from his specific actions and locates it with the gods. And what essentially Euthyphro says in his second response is, piety or goodness, good actions or pious actions are actions that the gods like, actions that the gods approve of. And impiety, or bad actions, immoral actions, those are the kinds of actions that the gods don't like. And at this point, um, Socrates, you know, again, gee, thank you, Euthyphro, I, I really appreciate this response, but I see a problem with it. And the problem that Socrates sees in this second response is a problem that's rooted in the fact that both Euthyphro and Socrates live in a polytheistic society. That is, that they live in a society that acknowledges the existence of multiple, multiple gods, multiple supernatural beings. It's a polytheistic society, not a monotheistic one where there's one centralized, central, unified, omnipotent being, but many gods. And so Socrates tells you, he says, well, look, dude, uh, some gods like one thing, and then there are other gods that dislike that same, that very same thing. And so you can take one action and find, you know, four gods that approve of or like that action, but there's another four or five gods that disapprove of that action. And so, you Euthyphro, I've asked you this question, what is piety? And what you've identified for me instead are things that are both good and bad, both pious and impious. It just depends on which god you happen to ask. So you're still not answering my question, you Euthyphro, is what Socrates says. Um, because you're telling me what's both good and bad, and what I asked for is what's good. Um, what's good or what's bad, but not both. And so, Euthyphro's third attempt makes yet a, the most significant revision in his, his line of thinking. And, and this is what Euthyphro says. Euthyphro says, okay, when we talk about piety, when we talk about the pious, when we talk about the good, when we talk about a morally correct action, uh, or, a, or a good thing. We're talking about the things that all of the gods like. Um, it's not just that some like it and some don't. All of them like it. If, if all of the gods approve of something, then that thing is pious. That thing is good. And if all of the gods disapprove of something or reject something, then that thing, could, that thing is bad. And if there are things that some gods like and some gods don't, uh, then that thing's just indeterminate. We really don't know what to say about that. But what we do know, Euthyphro says, is that the, the actions that all of the gods approve of are good, are pious, are moral actions, and the actions that all of the gods disapprove of and reject, those are bad actions, those are immoral actions. Now this is, this, this is important for us for, for a couple of reasons. One is, what Euthyphro does by um, claiming that an action that all of the gods agree is good or bad um, is he allows us to apply the argument to not just polytheistic cultures but also uh, monotheistic cultures because to say that an action that all of the gods approve or disapprove of um, is moral or immoral is analogous to saying that an action that one, that a monotheistic uh, god, one god approves of or disapproves of is moral or immoral. So this is important for us because it, it's an, it becomes an argument that we can talk about not just in polytheistic cultures but in monotheistic cultures as well. And it gives rise to this idea of what's been termed the divine command theory of ethics. And the divine command theory of ethics, we'll, we'll talk more about this uh, as we read uh, our text. The divine command theory of ethics essentially says um, the, we determine whether or not an action is good or bad or uh, whether or not we have a duty to do something based on God's commands. If God commands it, it's good. Uh, or if God commands us to do something, that thing is the good thing, the right thing, the morally right thing to do. If God commands us to avoid doing something, then that thing, by definition, is an immoral thing. Um, and so the divine command theory of 
um, of ethics says that you ultimately find the basis for your moral judgments and uh, your code of ethics in the divinity. Um, and there's a, a whole bunch of complications with that, um, but in this particular dialogue, the complication that um, Socrates focus on, focuses on is the questions that the divine command theory of, of Euthyphro's argument the questions that it raises about the nature of the good and its relationship to God. Uh, in other words, it raises questions for Socrates about the relationship between morality and God. Um, and this is sort of where the dialogue ends up going from here. Now, the, the, the main question for Socrates at this point is this. Um, if you claim that something is if you claim that the things that are good are the things that God approves of, or, and the things that are bad are the things that God disapproves of, it raises two questions. Do the gods love the things that are good because they're good? Do the gods love what's pious because it's pious? Um, do, or is it good because the gods like it? In other words, is, is there, are the things out there that God likes good on their own, or do they become good when God chooses to like them? And this is a significant question for Socrates, and it remains a significant question um, for us today. And it's the implications of the questions, the questions that are uh, really problematic. Because if we answer, if we say that, that, a thing is good because God likes it, um, then we're saying that the things that God likes don't really have any value that inheres in them on their own. The, the value that they get comes from God um, entirely. Uh, that the, if we say that a thing is good because God likes it, we're saying that that thing exists without value and it's not really good um, it's only good because God has chosen it, or that God has liked it, and in the process of liking it, has invested it with goodness. And this is troubling for Socrates for a couple of reasons. One is, it means that nothing is inherently right or wrong. Nothing is inherently good or bad. It's only good or bad or right or wrong to the degree that God has embraced it. Um, it also, the implication here is that there would be no right or wrong, there would be no morality, there would be no piousness without God. If God didn't exist, the world, the universe would be uh, uh, a container, it, it would contain only a bunch of value-neutral actions and objects. Nothing would be good or bad, nothing would have any values. But more concerning for Socrates, and more concerning for critics of divine command theory, is that if something is good, not because of what it is, but because of God's attitude toward it, then that really means that moral values are arbitrary, that they're really based on God's particular whims and preferences, and that nothing is inherently good. And, and that puts human beings in a really vulnerable place, because, of course, human beings want to please God, uh, and they want to do what God commands, but if God is, what God is commanding is simply based on his preferences, and God is omnipotent, and God transcends all, then God can change his mind. And what may be regarded as good and moral and worthy today, because God likes it, may change tomorrow. God may decide, you know, I'm, I'm done with that, now I like this. And, and that puts human beings in, in a precarious position because morality becomes very unpredictable and very unstable. For example, you know, maybe today God says, you know, courage is a good. It's a very good value, it's a good character trait, it's a virtue. But tomorrow God wakes up and says, you know, I'm, I'm a little burnt out on that courage stuff. Um, I'm kind of digging the idea of cowardice. All right, I like cowardice. Well, now all of a sudden, cowardice becomes the virtue. Cowardice becomes the good. Um, and for human beings, this is really a problem because it essentially makes humans into uh, slaves and God into kind of a slave master where we're just watching the whims of an arbitrary God who determines what is good and right based on preference. And that is not, for Socrates, a reliable framework for any kind of meaningful morality. So Socrates rejects that, or has, takes issue with that first possibility, the possibility that things are good because God likes them. And 
Then he takes up the second possibility, which is, all right, so maybe it's not that things are good because God likes them. Maybe God likes what he likes because those things are good. Maybe God, because he is good, maybe God is drawn to certain things. He's drawn to certain actions or drawn to certain ideas or drawn to certain objects because the objects or the actions or the ideas themselves possess some sort of inherent goodness. Um, and they possess those things uh, and and that and the fact that they possess those things on their own is what draws God's God uh, to them. <clears throat> so so it's not that the things are good because God likes them. It's that God likes likes those things because those things are good. But again, for Socrates, this raises a significant problem because if the objects or the actions of their ideas have goodness inherent in them. And, that, and God is drawn to those things because of that inherent quality, then that means that there are things in the universe that, that exist that aren't contingent on God. Uh, that means that there are things beyond God, and God is drawn to those things. And that's problematic for the notion that God is omnipotent, and that God is the source of all things, and that God is all good. He, he couldn't pot, logically, he can't be those things if he is drawn to other things that have an inherent quality of good that isn't contingent on God. That's, a, the, again, another problem. So the, the issue that comes up for us is Euthyphro, Euthyphro and Socrates at this point, they kind of run through a, a series of, I don't know, if they, they run through a total of six or seven different definitions of piety and trying to locate its source. And ultimately, they come to the conclusion that, or Euthyphro does, gee, I guess I didn't know as much as I thought I did. And Socrates says, oh, that's okay, dude, let's see if we can figure this out together. Um, and ostensibly, maybe they do. Uh, although we don't see it anywhere in the dialogue. Um, but what's important for us is this, is that by raising this Euthyphro dilemma, this, this question about the relationship between God and good, and God and morality, and by, by pointing out the problem with thinking that the good comes from God's preferences, and the problem of thinking that God prefers things that are good, what Socrates is doing, or what Plato is doing through Socrates, is he is forcing us to think really carefully about what exactly the good is based on, and where it's located, and what the nature of the good is. Which is really a way of, of asking questions like, where are values located? Um, if, they're, if they're something more than just figments of our imagination, if they're something, if they're in any sense real, and they're not just hallucinations or products of our imagination, where do they come from? What are they based on? When we make a moral claim, how do I know that that claim isn't just a statement that is similar in nature to me stating a preference about my fla favorite flavor of ice cream? When I say that killing children is immoral, what makes that claim have any more weight, uh, and what makes it a moral claim uh, in any meaningful sense, more than saying I like chocolate ice cream better than vanilla, although actually I like vanilla better than chocolate. Um, but the point here is that if we're going to say that moral claims have a particular kind of uh, worth and meaning, then we have to be able to establish what that worth and meaning is based on and where that worth and meaning come from. And this is what Socrates is trying to get us to think about. This is what Plato is trying to get us to think about. What is the relationship, if any, between morality and God? And if does morality need God might be a question that we would ask ourselves, and we'll take that up soon. Um, and if morality is dependent on God, what's the relationship between morality and God? And that's, that's what Socrates is trying to, trying to kind of tease out for us and get us to think a little bit about. All right? So keep thinking about these questions. We'll pick them up in our class meeting. Uh, we'll tease them out. You know, again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get our heads wrapped around kind of generally what's the terminology of ethics uh, what does it look like to have ethical conversation or conversations about ethics, to have conversations about morality and values? Um, how do we do that? 
And, you know, what are the problems in attempting to do that? And the, the, the Euthyphro dialogue uh, helps us get a little bit further into some of those uh, methods and those complexities. All right, so keep thinking, and I'll see you in class.